Please take your Bibles and go to James chapter 5, if you would, please. James chapter 5. I'd like to start by reading this entire chapter, which is 20 verses, as we look at the overall theme of the book of James is living for Jesus, and it takes active living. It takes active living is the title of the message this morning, James chapter 5. I begin reading here in verse 1. It says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and have been wanton, and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it. Until he receive the early and latter rain, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. As we look at the message of the text of Scripture this morning, I want to cover the first six verses of Scripture that really deals with the subject of materialism. In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, the following. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Then we find in chapter 3 the devil bypasses Adam altogether and goes directly to Eve. He begins a conversation with Eve and uh, just begins by saying these words. And God said, or I should say Eve says this, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. You notice how that what Eve did is she added to the Word of God. God had just said you should not eat of it. And here she adds, Thou shalt not touch it. Further to the downfall was, was that she continued speaking with the devil. And the tragedy strikes for all of mankind here in chapter 3 and verse 6 when the scripture says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, 
and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice that Adam was with Eve through this process. All that was taking place, the scripture is quite clear, it says that he was with her. His passivity was really what the problem was and what drove mankind into sin and out of the garden of God. And so the Christian life is not a passive life. It's one of action. And as we look here in this particular passage of Scripture in James chapter 5, that's why I've entitled it that living for Jesus takes active living. God has been active even before the foundation of the world in the affairs of man. In 1 Peter, just the next book over, it's one page in my Bible, it says these words in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So we see how God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who've always been, uh, they, we, they were active even before the earth was formed. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says these words, you know it well. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We also see in regards to the Christian life, how that the Apostle Paul was active in his service for Christ. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And what I'm trying to show us is that the Christian life is not passive. It is active. And many people think that once they trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they just sit back and wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not the way life works. That's not the way the Christian life works. And we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, writes the following. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, that's the good news, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Here's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me, also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. And we're to be active as well. We sometimes look at these Bible characters and say, well, that was good for them. But the Bible says these words in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So when you get to the book of James, you see a lot of action taking place here. Once again, we see that because you're saved, James is laying that foundation for us and saying, you can't just talk about salvation. You can't just claim to be saved. 
You ought to live out that faith every single day of your life. Not just talking about it, not just in the confines of your house, but in every area of your life. Whatever your hands touch, wherever your feet go, it ought to be permeated with the idea that you're living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that evident in these five chapters. It's very fascinating to me as I study these five chapters just how practical it is and how it touches so many areas of life. Living for Jesus, as I say, takes active living. If you're taking notes, I've outlined this chapter in the following way. Active against materialism in verses 1 to 6, and that's going to be where we really center our attention this morning on uh, this message. But number two, we find active and enduring through trials, verses 7 to 12. You see the uh, practicality of the Word of God. Active in pursuing personal holiness in verses 13 to 18, and then active in helping other believers in verses 19 and 20. I want to read once again just to bring us back into focus about how that we are to be active against materialism. It says here in verse 1, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. It's interesting to note that James gets right to the point of his message here in chapter 5, talking about the sin of the rich men who happen to be believers, yet these particular individuals have strayed because of money and the things that money can afford them. And it mentions in three ways. They've sinned in these three ways, as you see in our text from verse 3. That is the amassing of wealth. In other words, someone had said, as J.D. Rockefeller years ago, how much money is enough? And the answer was, a little more. And it's never satisfied, it seems, in the heart of man to have enough money. They always want a little more. And these believers were remembering that this text is not just to the general population. Uh, this text is actually written to those who have been scattered abroad. They had assimilated in some areas, yes, with intense persecution as we saw in chapter 1. But others had actually become a part of society and sad to say had congregated amongst their own people and had taken advantage of them. And so we find just as in Nehemiah's day, we find that uh, James is addressing these believers who have abused the money that has uh, been brought their way. They have amassed the wealth in verse 3. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Also they had defrauded. That's one of the ways that they had gotten their, their wealth, is they had actually taken advantage of other people. It's not a sin to make money. It's not a sin to uh, have a business that makes money, but it is a sin to build your wealth upon the backs of others and take advantage of them and not give them their due. And that's what uh, James is actually addressing here, that they were taking advantage of their brothers and sisters in Christ. And of course, as we study Colossians and study Galatians and Ephesians and they talk about masters and servants and so on. It can work both ways. But here it's interesting that as James is bringing this book to a close, he addresses the rich men who had actually acquired a lot of wealth and yet were consuming upon their own lust. And so they were defrauding their workers in verse 4. Behold, the hire of the laborers 
who have reaped down your fields, that's worked for them, which is of you kept back by fraud, that's cheating them of their due wages, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. So here it's interesting that what we do in the affairs of mankind, God notices. He keeps the books. He keeps a record. And sometimes we think we're getting something over on someone, and yet God takes note of that, especially as believers take advantage of other believers. And then we find here in verse 5, the sins that they were involved in was not only the uh, amassing of wealth and also the defrauding of workers, but also living for the luxuries of life. Now notice I said living for the luxuries of life. I didn't say it was wrong to have the luxuries, but it's wrong if that's your motivation and that's what you're living life for so that you can eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. In verse 5 it says, Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. We've got to remember, dear Christian, that the devil seeks to take advantage of us in a multitude of ways. And it's interesting that he will use poverty in some people's lives, and he will also use wealth in some people's lives to drive them from the Savior. I like the words of Proverbs from uh, Solomon where he says these words here in verses 7, 8, and 9 of Proverbs 30. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. It's like somebody said, it's not wrong to have things, but it's wrong for things to have you. And of course, we look at the scriptures and we see a balanced approach to this particular topic of wealth. And we know that Abraham was a rich man. And if you study the background of some of these places, even in Genesis chapter 12, when Abram was called out of the Earl of the Chaldees into a land that God would ultimately show him, that area that he lived in was a wealthy area. And he was a rich man already. And so it's not wrong to have riches. And he even mentions in our text here later on about who's not been impressed by the life of Job. How many times do we run to Job in times of discouragement to see how he weathered the storm and how God blessed him in his latter end. And yet you read in chapter 1 of Job where he was the richest man of the east. He had flocks. He had herds. I mean, he had possessions. He had lands. He had money. He had servants. And yet it was all stripped from him. And then God gave it back to him after uh, that time of the miserable comforters and God teaching him some powerful truth. But Job was a rich man. How about Zacchaeus in uh, Luke chapter 19, where Zacchaeus, that wee little man who climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus trusts Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. But it's interesting that Zacchaeus, just by being a tax collector, would be a rich man by that day's standards just if he legitimately charged the taxes and took that portion that was allotted him uh, from the king. But he actually was gouging people, taking advantage of people. But when he trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, he told Jesus, he said, you know what, when I've taken whatever I've taken by defrauding them, cheating them, I'm going to restore fourfold. So he not only had uh, illegitimate riches, he had some legitimate riches as well so that he could pay back with interest the money that he had stolen from people. And you notice when he said that, Jesus was impressed because he said, wow, he said, salvation has come to this house. In other words, salvation 
uh, just changed him from one creature to another creature. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. His life was changed and he made those wrongs right. He knew he had taken advantage of people and now uh, Jesus Christ had changed his life and he was going to do the honest thing and give that wealth back. So Zacchaeus was a rich man. God never rebuked him for having money. God never rebuked Job for having money or Abraham. How about Barnabas? Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. The church was going through some unbelievable things there in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, the church was growing by leaps and bounds. We know in chapter 1 they were numbering about 120 in the upper room. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, uh, we see 3,000 people getting saved. And so they got baptized. They joined the church. They were joined unto them, the scripture says. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We find that the church just experienced explosive growth. The next chapter, chapter 4, we find that 4,000 other uh, men had trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So you talk about a mega church. Uh, the church of Jerusalem was a mega church. And because of that, in Jerusalem be a, a hotbed of activity and many cultures assimilating there, there were a lot of needs that arose. You had a lot of trade going on, a lot of work going on, and a lot of needs being evident. And some people had the resources, but there were a number of people that did not have the resources to take care of themselves. So the church got together. They amassed some money together so that they could begin to pass out uh, to the congregation those that had need. And we find that Barnabas had some land, the scripture says, and sold that land. And he gave the entire proceeds of that land to the church, laid it, it says, at the apostles' feet, and then distribution was made from that point to those that had need. I would say that Barnabas was a well-to-do man. It's another thing when you look in Acts chapter 5, though, those first 11 verses of scripture, you have the account of Ananias and Sapphira were they too. They were impressed with the giving of Barnabas and they uh, actually told the church, hey, we're, we sold some land as well and we're going to give everything uh, to the church for the care of the poor saints here in Jerusalem. And uh, of course they had already conspired together that they weren't going to give it all, but they were going to tell everybody. So they portrayed themselves to do something in the name of God that they did not do. And of course we know they had judgment fall upon them. And these accounts are not trying to disparage those with money. He's just saying you need to make sure that you live properly in light of the finances that God gives you. If God gives you a lot, make sure you're a good steward. If God gives you little, make sure you're a good steward of what he gives to each and every one of you. These men that I just mentioned used their wealth for the glory of God. And what we need to learn to do is it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And it's interesting that when you get here to the book of James, that of all the subjects that could be talked about, he addresses these rich men who had been taken advantage of other believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you a question this morning. What are you doing with the wealth God has given you? What are you doing with the wealth that God has given you? You don't have to answer that to me. And that's never when I preach a message, any message, it's not me you have to answer to. I just lay this out from the Word of God so that you before God can answer the question and I trust, answer it properly and with a clear conscience before Him. And if not, then that's a point of reference that you can go before the throne of grace and find help in a time of need. And this attitude that we have needs to really permeate every single one of us in our motivation of why we live the way we live and the things we do with what He blesses us with. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want to turn there. 1 Timothy chapter 6, as you know I mentioned at the beginning of the service as we looked at 
1 Timothy chapter 2, in chapter 6, it talks about wealth in this passage. And this, these principles that are mentioned in 1 Timothy, uh, this is the instructions that a pastor uh, has been given from a senior pastor to a pastor which is Timothy. And uh, he is telling them uh, the different things that need to be emphasized uh, in the service of the church. And so he addresses this matter of wealth as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3, it says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that means uh, healthy words. Anytime you preach the word, it's healthy, it's good. And it says here, And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse dis disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from uh, such, withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Drop down to verse 17, if you would, of the same passage. It says, charge them that are rich in this world. That's, charge is a very strong word. And in, Paul is telling Timothy, when you preach, you charge them, you command them, you tell them, you lay it out straight. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. What's he saying is you're to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal, Matthew chapter 6. And this attitude towards wealth does not do away with you excelling in business, does not do away with you being wise in the way you handle your finances. In fact, it actually helps you to improve. You say, how's that, Pastor? Because you're seeking to give God glory. You're seeking to do your best. And as you live for Him from day to day, he will help you to be the best that you can be at whatever endeavor that you're involved in. And so in the course of fulfilling God's plan and purpose for your life, if he gives you wealth, praise the Lord. He's given you that trust for a purpose, for you to use that tool for his honor and his glory. And one day you'll give an answer for it. But as you put to work the blessings of God in your life on this earth, you are laying also up treasure in heaven that where the moth and rust is not corrupt, where your gold and silver is not cankered. And so we see how vital it is to have the right attitude, even in the course of making our wealth. He chooses to give you prosperity. That's a blessing. If he chooses to give you a prosperity, I trust you'll honor him with it, that you're obedient in tithes and offerings and the extra blessings that you can give out and help uh, the, the, those in need and the church as we send the gospel out around the world. In my notes here, I've got several names listed here uh, just to tweak my mind at this time. And I can't mention all of them here. But I am so grateful in the course of the ministry of people who have 
use the resources that God has given them, that they don't fit this particular passage of Scripture here in James chapter 5, the first six verses of Scripture. I will, I will use uh, a couple of names here. Clark Mills is one of those. If you go on the second floor of our educational building, you'll see that there's two rooms uh, that are dedicated to uh, Clark, uh, some of Clark Mills' family. I remember Clark came here to church and a very unassuming man. I think he was uh, just across the street neighbor with uh, Gary and Lisa there in Morden years ago. And uh, you would walk into his house very plain. And uh, I remember he called me to his house one day. And uh, we're talking and he said, uh, Pastor Sullivan, uh, take my checkbook. Ooh. You know, preachers, we get a bad name for wanting everybody's money. And uh, so I, I thought, uh, Clark, I, you know, like, what are you talking about? He says, well, and his eyesight was bad. He said, I need you to uh, get me my checkbook. It's right over there. So I got his checkbook. He said, I want you to write it out for me. And so he said, I want you to write a check out for $20,000. I said, Clark, <laughs> you know, and he says, uh, you know, and he had a love for the King James Bible. And that's how he got introduced to our church. Uh, he had a love for the King James Bible, and he wanted to support a work that stood on the Bible, the Word of God. And so uh, he, he had me write this check out and uh, made it out to Pimmon Valley Baptist Church. As soon as I left the house, I got in the car, and I called his uh, nephew. I think it was his nephew, maybe a cousin. He only had like one a relative that looked after his, uh, uh, his things. And so I called him, and he lived in uh, Musselman, uh, Saskatchewan. And I, I said, Larry, I said, uh, Clark just had me write a check for $20,000. And I said, I need to tell somebody because I don't want this to come back and, and bite us on this. And he says, Pastor Sullivan, no problem. He's got plenty of money, and he wants to give it to the church. Let him do it. I said, well, just so you know, and uh, what he did with that 20000 he said, I want you to take and I want you to buy computers for the church. So when you walk over to the church, and we all went to Apple, uh, that cult Apple, we, we went to uh, Apple products, and our Apple computers and everything originally were bought because Clark Mills wanted to help our church here. Had no idea that when he would pass away that uh, he would leave the church almost $300,000 and so when we had the parking lot lights on and the lights around the building and some of the other things we were able to do around here, it was because of this man who God had blessed financially. And he said, you know what? When I die, I want to leave something here for the glory of God. And that's what he did. And I could go on and on with other individuals that have helped us through the years. We've had people do great things, good things. Some of the things we've been able to do in missions is because of the giving of, yes, you dear people. But then there's been other individuals as well that have gotten the burden for the souls of mankind and they have been blessed financially in a way that we've been able to uh, help build buildings on the mission field and send missionaries out. I think God's pleased with that. And uh, sometimes if we're not careful, we'll heap uh, just the treasure on ourselves. We'll lay it up for generations that will follow us that may not handle it properly, but yet we could dictate how the money is spent for the glory of God. I don't have any ulterior motive, and I hesitated as I was preparing this message because uh, people of the world and maybe even some carnal Christians would get the idea that I'm preaching like this because I want money or the church wants money. No, if you notice when we take offerings around here, special offerings, we always say this. You pray and you ask God what he would have you do and you give that amount and we'll be okay. And you know, through the years, I can't think of any project that the church has taken on where we've not had those words given and where the need has not been met. God always meets the need as people are obedient to him. There's a saying, I forget who said it, it says where God guides, he provides. And you know, when he's in charge, 
It's amazing what can be done to his honor and his glory. And so as you look at this passage of scripture, these six verses here, oh, you find him admonishing the rich men who had been uh, just taking advantage of God's people. But on the flip side of that, it's inferred here in scripture. These men had been disobedient, but praise God, there's that core of people who have allowed God to bless them and then utilize that to the glory of God, that wealth that they've been given. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, the scripture says these words, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. You cannot outgive God. Once again, what are you doing with the wealth that God has given you? Let's all stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, please. As I mentioned in the message, it's not a question you have to answer to me. We don't look at your giving record. But God sees. And I just asked, you've been given a trust. What you've been given, God has allowed you to acquire. Are you using it to his honor and glory? It doesn't mean you have to give it to the church. You just need to give it to God. You just need to obey God in the matter. And if you obey God in the matter, your conscience is clear, praise the Lord. Honor him.